In the previous section, we talked a lot about the role of the FDA in the drug discovery process. However, the FDA is not the only player when it comes to dealing with regulatory and legal issues. In this section, we will look more at both domestic and international regulatory environments and how it affects the process of getting drugs and treatments to the marketplace. There are two distinct sides to the regulatory coin. Companies and their investors see regulations as a considerable expense in drug development, as a process that delays getting products to the marketplace. A lot of paperwork, which in today's systems revolves around electronic document preparation and management, and a series of hurdles that have to be crossed in order to take the considerable investment in time, money, and resources that went into product development and generate income. The other side of the coin is the consumer's view. Consumers see regulation as protection against bad products and products that might be contaminated, as we have seen over the past few years with drug and pet food products coming from China. It isn't just a concern about the effectiveness of the initial drug, but also it addresses product quality as drugs continue to be produced in large quantities. There are also concerns about variation in product quality and potency, counterfeit drugs, and also protection against business practices that either harm or defraud the consumer. In addition to the FDA, there are a number of other organizations that have their own regulatory frameworks. The list on the screen, which includes the U.S. Pharmacopoeia Convention, the Environmental Protection Agency, and international bodies is just a partial list of the organizations that affect how drug manufacturers work within the domestic international community. Most industrialized countries have their own set of regulations that govern the production of products and life science industries. In some cases, with the development of the European Union, these groups merged. There are still a large number of them and if you want to deal with product sales on the international market, all the regulations need to be addressed. As you might imagine, there is considerable overlap in the work done in various geographies, so the problem of addressing different regulatory requirements is not as severe as it might first appear. One organization that affects the operations of laboratory work is the United States Pharmacopoeia Convention. This is a non-government, non-profit organization that sets the standards for product quality and product testing within the U.S. These standards are necessary to ensure that testing, potency, and product uniformity are determined in a consistent way across the industry. These standards are relied on in more than 130 countries and are legally enforceable in the United States by the FDA. As a result, laboratories that do testing have to rely on their procedures and show they are in conformity with the requirements. The Environmental Protection Agency plays a role in drug manufacture because it has to be concerned with the effects of materials used in manufacturing, manufacturing waste products, and the disposal of drugs into the environment. There have been a number of reports in recent years concerning the fact that most domestic public water supplies are contaminated to some degree with antibiotics and other trace pharmaceutical compounds. As a result, the EPA has an important role to play in ensuring that this contamination does not pose a significant health or environmental risk. Given the number of organizations worldwide that are involved with regulatory issues, you might be concerned with how to deal with potentially conflicting requirements. The International Conference on Harmonization was created as an independent international body to address and resolve regulatory issues in Europe, Japan, and the U.S., so the potential problem has been recognized and is being addressed. As we noted in the previous section, 
The purpose of regulations in the clinical trials process is to ensure that drugs and treatments under consideration are safe and effective, that the side effects are understood, and that there is some assurance that when the drug goes to market, it will provide an effective treatment for whatever condition is being addressed. Post-production reviews by the FDA are designed to ensure product safety, that the drug dosage is consistent and correct from batch to batch, the product is free of contamination, properly packaged and being properly prescribed for use by you, the consumer. Regulations are rarely created in anticipation of a problem and are generally a response to an issue. The term snake oil salesman has been around for a long time and it is based on practices that existed over a hundred years ago. Vendors would create treatments for diseases and conditions and sell them as cures. They rarely worked, if ever, aside from a placebo effect and often cause new problems as a result of contamination. If you don't believe things like that could happen today, take a look at the words on the screen and see if you've ever encountered them. They often show up as fine print on TV screens that are promoting treatments for weight loss, hair loss, and a variety of other conditions. The problems of fake treatments and contaminated products became significant enough that in 1906 the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed. Its purpose was to protect the public against alteration of food and from products identified as healthy without any scientific support. Among its provisions was the creation of the FDA, the requirement of prescriptions from licensed physicians before you can purchase certain drugs, and the requirement of a label warning about habit-forming drugs. The problems with improperly prescribed and use of drugs continues in the modern era. In the 1950s, a drug called thalidomide was introduced as a sedative. In 1961, it was found to cause severe birth defects. Although the drug was never approved for sale in the United States, it was widely distributed by physicians as part of a clinical trials program as a treatment for morning sickness in pregnant women. Legal cases concerning the drug's use are still being prosecuted as late as December 2011 in Australia. As a result of the experience with thalidomide in 1962, the Kefauver Harris Amendment was added to the Pure Food and Drug Act with additional controls to drug manufacturer and distribution. Manufacturers had to show the effectiveness of their products as well as their safety and report adverse conditions to the FDA. Informed consent was required for all participants in clinical trials. The FDA was given jurisdiction over drug advertising. The process of new drug applications was instituted to control how drugs were manufactured and distributed. Inspection of drug manufacturers was required every two years. Today, the regulatory landscape consists of a number of practices, including good laboratory practices from both the EPA and the FDA, good manufacturing practices, practices concerning automated laboratory work and manufacturing, the ISO 9000 suite of practices, which covers manufacturing quality control operations, and finally, ISO 1725, which is designed to ensure quality and laboratory management. Each of these has aspects that impact information technology groups. Next, we are going to briefly cover three technology initiatives by the FDA that will have an impact on lab work and, in turn, IT support. Electronic signatures, quality by design, QBD, process analytical technologies, PAT. Our intent is to provide an overview, which you can follow up with in more detail by using the references cited. 
One of the more recent developments has been in the area of electronic signatures. The information you see on the screen points you to references for the FDA's guidance on the subject. For generations, laboratory scientists have recorded the results of their work in paper-based laboratory notebooks. The image on the bottom of the screen shows a detail of the page that might be found in any laboratory notebook. As work is completed, the scientist has to sign and date the page and have the material witnessed by another individual who signs and dates the same page. The purpose of this process is to ensure that their work is authentic, complete, understood, and correct. This attention to this detail is important because the work that is being done represents intellectual property that may be used in filing patents or defending a company if work or products are challenged in court. The problem we have today is developing the same controls and authentication in laboratory information management systems, electronic laboratory notebooks, or any electronic document. Some form of electronic signatures is necessary to provide the same level of authentication as we had with paper-based systems. One reason this has become so significant and important is that the FDA has moved away from paper-based submissions to electronic submissions of documents via the FDA's Electronic Submissions Gateway. It is necessary for those submitting documents to be able to sign and authenticate them as they would have been able to do with paper documents. So you want to have the insurance that the documents are the real deal. Electronic signatures are a way of addressing that. Electronic submissions apply to everything we've seen in the drug discovery process. Information you see on the screen talks about what the FDA is expecting in the way of digital signatures. They include Scan signatures, raster or vector images of a real signature. Digital signatures. These can include public key encrypted signatures and Adobe self-signed IDs. And flattened digital signatures, which are illustrated on the next slide. This is an area that is undergoing rapid development, and any course material on this subject is going to go out of date quickly. If this is an area that needs your attention, review the documents noted on the previous slides and material on the FDA's website. Web searches will point to a growing list of references and articles. This illustration is an example taken from the FDA's documentation about what a flattened digital signature is and contains the element shown on the screen. The printed name of the signer, the date and time the signature was executed, and a reason for a signature. Electronic signatures are just one example of the FDA's effort to address modern technologies and processes as they apply to life sciences manufacturing. Quality by design is another initiative. Manufacturing plants are large and expensive enterprises and in life sciences applications that cost is amplified by the need to meet regulatory requirements. One concept that is common to several regulatory approaches, including ISO 9000, is that of validation, something we'll talk about in more detail in a few minutes. Validation is a matter of documenting the process that is used to design, implement and test systems that are put into use. It applies to both laboratory and manufacturing systems and can be expensive to implement. Once a system is validated, you really don't want to go through a lot of changes because that entails revalidating whatever you're working on. If you have a functioning manufacturing operation that is past all its inspections, you really don't want to go about changing it. This has led to some problems in improving manufacturing operations. For example, upgrading technologies is often delayed because the need to meet regulatory requirements. The company might choose to live with a manufacturing problem rather than fix it because of the cost involved. 
What results is a barrier to improving the efficiency of manufacturing operations, which led to increased drug costs? Quality by design was seen as a way of addressing those problems. The basic idea behind quality by design is that product quality is designed into the manufacturing process rather than having it tested in. It allows for continuous improvement of manufacturing processes, the ability to make changes to increase efficiency and quality without having to rebuild a production facility, something that is common in automotive and chemical industries. All of this is based on a better scientific understanding of the production process and the ability to control the product quality during production. Companies can improve product quality by better understanding the factors that affect quality and carry out real-time monitoring of those elements, catching problems before they can significantly affect production. Quality testing and monitoring are designed into the production system as continuous in-process monitoring systems. The difference between designing quality into the system rather than testing it in is important. It means higher production of high quality products, less waste and lower costs. It also demonstrates better control of the production system. The traditional approach to manufacturing is to make the product and then have it evaluated by quality control to see if it meets the product specifications. If it does, the product is shipped Otherwise, it is reworked or designated as scrap. The production of electrical resistors is a good example of tested in product quality. Resistors are made in large batches and it is difficult to control the tolerance of the resistor as it is produced. If a resistor is targeted at 10 ohms, there may be wide variation in the product quality due to the inability to control the production process. The illustration on the screen on the bottom right is a resistor that has four bands on it. The three bands on the left give you an idea of what the value of the resistor should be. The band on the right gives you an idea what the tolerance is. You can see more detail about the four band code by looking at the chart at the top of the screen. The better the tolerance, the higher the price that can be charged for the unit. When resistors are manufactured, each resistor is tested and sorted according to tolerance. This is an example of testing in product quality. With the quality of the products determined after manufacture rather than controlled during manufacture. In the pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries where products are made in large volumes and batches, you really want to have quality designed in rather than tested in to avoid waste materials and increase production costs. The drive toward in-process testing and quality evaluation is a step toward designing quality in. As part of the process for improving product quality using the quality by design approach, companies would address issues such as tighter control over incoming raw materials, since defects in raw materials will translate into product defects. In addition, there is a continual upgrading of technology to improve the ability to control and monitor the process instead of relying on older techniques. This last point includes implementation of inline analysis replacing the traditional approach of taking samples and having them evaluated by quality control. This would result in faster problem detection and the ability to remedy problems, thus reducing waste and off-spec material. This diagram helps us understand the relationship between quality by design ideas and traditional manufacturing quality control. The arrows show traditional manufacturing. Raw materials come in, the production process takes place in several steps, and the product goes to quality control for evaluation and certification. As you move towards quality by design, quality control checks incoming raw materials automatically. 
In many companies today, this has been adopted as standard practice by either testing of raw materials or evaluating the vendor's certificate of analysis after ensuring that the vendor's quality processes meet production standards. Even in these cases, spot checks of incoming raw materials are performed. In addition, both inline and online process analysis take place with results going to quality control and process control. The deviations from specification can be used to correct any process problems. One important thing in quality by design is that all of these elements are brought together during the design process for production. Monitoring and testing elements are designed in rather than added on at the end of the process. In effect, quality management is an integral part of the manufacturing operation. The third initiative we will look at is called Process Analytical Technology, where Quality by Design talked about the integration of testing and process monitoring as a means of improving product quality and reducing waste. These technologies talk about the tools and methodologies for understanding the manufacturing process and developing the technologies that can be used in the implementation of quality by design. There are many current and new tools available that enable scientific, risk-managed pharmaceutical development, manufacture, and quality insurance. These tools, when used within a system, can provide effective and efficient means for acquiring information to facilitate process understanding, develop risk mitigation strategies, achieve continuous improvement, and share information and knowledge. This is the understanding provided by the FDA. These tools include process modeling techniques, statistical experimental design, and other statistical tools to understand how process variables affect product properties and qualities. These can be very effective tools in optimizing a production system for high quality production and low cost. In addition, process analyzers, which directly monitor chemical and physical properties of materials used in the process or products at intermediate stages during production, can provide rapid feedback in the process about the state of product quality. This means that process variations can be detected earlier and fixed instead of waiting until the process is complete and discovering problems in post-production testing. It also provides for continuous improvement of systems, whether by changes in technology or evolutionary operations, control where the system is incrementally adjusted to improve processing and product quality parameters. What this means for IT professionals is that the design of production and production monitoring systems, including quality control, is going to become more computationally intensive and depend heavily on computers and networks to collect data that is integrated with laboratory and production database systems. It may even require that data be sent to process modeling programs that could be used to analyze and optimize production performance. This includes the use of online real-time controls and sensors that have to be monitored. The real-time aspect of the systems requires high levels of uptime and may require redundant backup systems to protect against data loss. It also requires the integration of process control database and monitoring systems, analytical instrumentation and data systems from multiple vendors with differing computing platforms and operating systems. One concept that's been mentioned a number of times in this presentation and in earlier sections is that of validation. This is a subject that is conceptually fairly simple but has caused considerable consternation in industry. When the FDA releases guidance for industry about good laboratory practices, the document contained a statement that all systems should be validated. 
Validation is defined as confirmation by examination and provision of objective evidence that the particular requirement for specific continued use can be constantly fulfilled. To put it simply, validation is documented proof that something works, is proven to do so, and can be relied upon to work properly. The purpose of validation is to develop a level of confidence in the systems that you're using for any purpose. Those systems may be instruments, automation systems, computer software, or anything that is used in the laboratory. When you're looking at validating systems, there is a hierarchical approach to dealing with systems evaluation and analysis. You want to make sure that at each level things work the way they are supposed to. In some cases, it may mean that the operation of one component depends upon the operation of the second component. If the second component isn't working properly, then anything that relies on it will be basing its results on faulty data. The whole point of validation procedures is to go through the operations under review. Make sure all components are designed properly for the purposes intended, that they work properly, and that they can properly be maintained over long periods of time. Again, the bottom line is simple. We want to build confidence in the systems that are being used to generate laboratory data. Laboratory systems can't be based on the assumptions that they work. If the data they generate is faulty, then all the work that's built on that data is similarly faulty. If you can't trust underlying data based on documented proof that the data is valid, then the whole structure fails. If you're doing testing using unvalidated test procedures to evaluate product quality, then any conclusions you draw are based on assumptions and not fact. In laboratory work, we need to be sure that conclusions are based on solid ground, and this means using validated test procedures, which can be relied on to provide accurate results. As a result, everything used in laboratory work, from test procedures to software, database systems, and people's ability to carry out tasks, has to be tested and demonstrated to function properly. As you might expect, the cost of developing validated systems can be expensive because of the amount of work that goes into the process. The FDA working with the industry is using a technique called risk-based validation, which uses risk assessment as a guide to implementing validation efforts, reducing costs, and achieving acceptable results. A risk-based approach to validation requires that the system be studied and that the risks for failure of each component of the system be determined. The bullets on the screen will give you an idea of the kind of things you need to look at. Prior to the evaluation, a document needs to be prepared that describes how risks are to be determined, how they are going to be ranked in terms of severity, and how they are going to be addressed. This chart is one example of a risk matrix that might be designed to support a risk-based validation program. It looks at the likelihood of a problem and the consequences for that problem, in this case, in terms of human injury. Note, in the laboratory work, you might look at the potential for causing incorrect data or some other criteria instead of human injury. In this case, areas where there is a high likelihood of occurrence and a high likelihood of serious injury will get the most scrutiny. Areas where there is no human injury and a very low likelihood that the problem manifests itself will receive little attention. As you might imagine, this allows some problems to slip through which might, in unforeseen circumstances, cause serious problems. So validation is not a one-time operation, but needs to be continuously reviewed to make sure that the assumptions that were used to design the program are still supportable. Another variation on risk-based validation programs is shown on this chart, GAMP, 
or good automation manufacturing practices is a system of regulations that can be applied to both manufacturing and laboratory applications. The five refers to the fact that it's in its fifth version. This chart looks at classes of systems, in this case computers and instruments, and determines the level of validation action that has to be taken based on each class. In the simplest case, class one, we are looking at operating systems, and the action the user needs to take is to record the version of the operating system and make sure it's suitable for the products that are layered on top of it. As you move through the classes, you can see that the work entailed increases depending upon the amount of customization and customer-specific attributes that are in place. In class five, where we are looking at custom software, the full suite of vendor audits and project management activities required. In traditional validation programs, for example, the type required in category five of the previous slide, there are two approaches to validation, retrospective and prospective validation. At a certain point, let's say today, we separate the use of these two approaches. Any systems that have not been validated would be using retrospective methods, basically going over the system in question, making sure the documentation is in place, checking any areas where there may be a question or where additional work is needed, and providing documented evidence that the system has been working according to design criteria. All other programs would be evaluated according to prospective methods that will be described in the following slides. One question that often comes up in project development is this. Why go through the trouble of validating something if you don't know the approach you are taking will work? It's a good question because frequently in development projects there are blind alleys and places where changes in direction take place. It isn't uncommon for people to build the system and then retrospectively validate it. One of the problems with this approach is that you may not have the best system possible. You may have taken some shortcuts in the development process. For example, using materials that are at hand instead of going off and evaluating specifications and vendors the way they need to be done in a properly validated project. What the systems do yield is a good prototype. It may be a working system, but during the course of development, that are often places that come up where we might say, if we had to do this again, would we do it better? Or, we'd use another approach that would yield better results. Prototypes are good places to start and give you a lot of worthwhile information to use as a basis for building a system for long-term use. Realistically, the very short-term projects the prototype may be good enough, but if a project is going to go on for a lengthy period of time and will be expected to produce data that is going to be used in critical applications such as patents or drug approvals, the job needs to be done right. What you learn from prototypes are where changes need to be made, the details of the product specifications needed for components, an evaluation of the user's reaction to what you're producing, which may result in changes to the project requirements or design. The bottom line is that we will have a better project and a better product. The illustration on the screen represents something called the GALP V. The V is taken from the shape of the diagram. This shows the process of developing software for an automated system. The same logic can be used for any automation project since most involve software development. On the left side of the diagram, you see the development of specifications for the project. On the bottom, the actual project development, and on the right, a series of tests that demonstrate that the system produced meets the requirements. The project begins with the development of user requirement specifications by the customer. The response, which is the responsibility of both the customer and supplier, which could be an internal group, 
consist of an overall functional specification and the hardware and software design requirements. In each case, these have to be jointly approved by both the customer and supplier. With the specifications in place, supplier then begins to develop the system, beginning with the development of specifications for each element in the software system, developing and reviewing the code, and then testing it to ensure that it's working properly. As we move up the stages on the right-hand side of the diagram, at each step, we test the elements produced against the specifications. Software is tested against software design specification, as is the hardware and software combined. And then we go through systems acceptance testing, and finally, a performance qualification. The last point is a final test of the system by the customer against the initial user requirement specification. If we look at the GALP V detail, what we really see is the outline of a good engineering project. We see expected elements, such as project requirement documents, functional specification, and design documents. That's followed by the development process. And finally, the testing and proof that the system works and does what it was expected to do. The validation project outlined produced in the good automated manufacturing practices exactly reflects a well-designed and implemented engineering program. In short, a solid project management and engineering program will lead to a validated system. One of the criticisms of the GALP approach is that it's a poor product life cycle diagram. It was never designed to be one. It is a design for project development program and does not include functions for maintenance, upgrades, or other considerations. The diagram on the right shows a product life cycle diagram that was used and developed by the Institute. Recognize that portions of the GALP diagram fit within this larger product life cycle illustration, but the illustration looks at much more. It shows what happens to products during the course of their lifetime in the marketplace. For example, once a product is in the field and it is successful, it may undergo revisions and upgrades. Those revision and upgrades have to be planned for realistically in your overall project's program requirements. Upgrading projects can have an impact on the lab's operation, although if done properly, the impact is fairly low. More significant are the impacts of a new product generation or if a product is retired. New product generation may have as much impact on your laboratory as installing a new product entirely. A lot depends on whether or not the vendor is designing a graceful upgrade. That is, the vendors, including provision for supporting the previous attributes of the product while adding new features. Installing a new product generation may mean redevelopment of any customization that has been done and any connections that are made to other systems. It also requires a complete revalidation of the system. Product retirement brings its own set of headaches. While it doesn't change the functionality or behavior of the existing system, it may have a significant impact on your ability to support it. This is particularly true if hardware is involved and replacement parts or consumables need to be addressed. They may not be available or may only become available through third-party vendors. Validation requirements involve a lot of documentation, including audit trails that provide a history of changes, why those changes were made, their impact on the system design, and how they were authorized. One element that is particularly useful is a requirement traceability matrix. This is a document that links requirements throughout the validation process. The purpose of the requirements traceability matrix is to ensure that all requirements defined for the system are tested in the testing protocols. 
the requirement traceability matrix is usually developed in concurrence with the initial list of requirements. As the design specifications and testing protocols are developed, the traceability matrix is updated. Ideally, requirements should be traced to do specific test steps in the testing protocols where they are tested. This matrix provides a means of understanding the impact of changes to product specifications, including those resulting from product upgrades. The matrix will give you a reference point for determining all the places where significant product changes have been made through customization and as a result where failures can result when upgrades are made. Meeting regulatory requirements, including validation, is essential to successful IT practices in life sciences industries. It's necessary to ensure high quality data and results, that decisions are based on sound information, and the information is acceptable to regulatory agencies. Much of what regulatory requirements need parallels good engineering and project management practices. In addition to the legal issues that they satisfy, meeting validation requirements can benefit the IT organizations since the documentation produced provides a thorough description of the project, can be used as a reference point for modifications and upgrades, provides a culprit memory for decisions, and finally, will assist whoever works on the project next. It could be you. Meeting the requirements of the regulatory environment is a necessary function to ensure product quality and safety, and companies take it very seriously. If these requirements are not met, the FDA can disapprove drug application requests, close production facilities, and require expensive changes to advertising and labeling. The regulations are there for both the companies and consumers' protection.